So you guys didn't tune in the last season, make sure you tune into this season. I got all cleaned up for you guys at home. I don't look like the homeless bum anymore. So new me, new season, tune in. We're coming back on the Last air. time on Graveyard Cars. I need help in that shop. I need somebody to help me QC. That's so I'll cool. take this. This sounds good. It was great. Okay. Graveyard Cars is going animated. Edit this. We ready to get going? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean you didn't paint it? A beautiful replica of an original Barracuda Grand Coupe. Bam. One of only eight ever made. Nothing will happen to you as long as you don't get between me and Christine. On this episode. We just moved around the next car for disassembly. 1970 Cuda. I don't remember exactly, but I think I thought I was told that this is a numbers matching car. Hmm. Okay. Like I say, I hope this situation is not what it's looking like. Looking good. They're coming to get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. I'm a liar and a fat mouth. His daughter, Alyssa Rose. <laughs> okay. Why would you do that? His painter, Will Scott. You got one job. And his cousin, Dougie. You're the best. Welcome back to Graveyard Cars. My name is Mark Warman, and I own Graveyard Cars. We're the number one Mopar restoration shop in the world. We restore Chrysler muscle cars back to the way they were on the assembly line. My name's Alyssa Rose. I work here at Graveyard Cars. Other than being Mark Warman's daughter, I run our parts room. I also head up our QC department and I do any other minute tasks that needs to be done. I'm Will Scott, I'm the painter here at Graveyard Cars. I do all the paint work, oversee the body work, the metal work a little bit, kind of run the back half of the shop, so to speak. Okay, so I'm Doug. Mark's cousin, cousin Dougie. I'm uh, My name is Justin Jesdahl. I work here at Graveyard Cars and I am the assembly tech. The Chrysler muscle car is without a doubt the most collectible American muscle car on the planet today. Some versions selling as much as three and a half million dollars. When these cars came out 50 years ago, they were bold. They were bold in their styling and they were bold in their engines. Chrysler offered such a wide variety of muscle cars. One was bound to suit your personality. And that's why today there are so many different variations, so many different classes and such collectability because it allowed you to be you. They were so crazy back in the day, you know, with their ideas, their color schemes, the packages they put together. Nobody else came close to it. They're just so unique in every aspect and just the engines, you know, the, the historic 426 Hemi, uh, the 440 Magnums. Just the sounds of these cars alone are just, they're just awesome. We stopped making cars cool in the 80s. I don't know why we did that, but we did. The style lines, the colors, the thought that went from the front to the back of the car, they didn't miss a beat. Everything today looks like a rental car. It looks the same. There's no body lines, there's no style. It's black, white, or red. Back in the 70s, that's not how it was. It was fun and it was cool. Will Scott has worked with me for over two decades, most of his adult life. As lead painter, Will is responsible to make sure that the body work is done correctly. The primer work, the jam work, the top coating of the base coat, clear coat, or single stage paint. Everything has to be perfect before it can get moved over to the assembly shop. When that car does roll from the paint shop into the assembly shop, each and every time is my proudest moment. Will does a great job and he's part of our family. Justin is our lead assembly technician. His job is to put these cars together once they're out of the paint shop. He is in charge of installing all of the exterior trim and ornamentation on the cars, assembling the interior, including the dash assembly, installing and plumbing out the engine, transmission, and rear end. And the best part of his job is when he hands me a set of keys and says, Mark, that car is ready to go. I do a final QC, I call the customer, and we're heroes.
Doug Oldham is my cousin and my friend. We call him Cousin Dougie. His job is to rebuild, assemble, and detail to OEM standards the engine, transmission, rear axle assembly, drive shaft, and front suspension. And I can tell you after 35 years of employing technicians, he is the best one I've ever worked with. I trust him with my cars, I would trust him with my life. Alyssa Rose is my daughter and she works with me side by side at Graveyard Cars. Alyssa has multiple responsibilities. To make sure that all of the parts are here to restore a car and that they are correct is only one of her many jobs. She also has to do quality control. Her job is to make sure that these guys do their job. And probably the most important of all of her responsibilities that could not be replaced easily is that she gets me my coffee. And she knows exactly how I like it. The right amount of creamer, the right amount of cocoa. I like cocoa in my coffee. She makes it perfect. We just moved around the next car for disassembly. 1970 CUDA 446 brought means it's a V code in the VIN. It's a A34 Super Track Pack. That means it has a Hemi 4 speed and a Super Track Pack 410 Dana rear end. It's FB5 Rally Red, white interior. This car belongs to Jim Root. Those of you who are Slipknot fans out there will recognize the name. So we made a deal, brought the car out here, and we're getting ready to start the disassembly now. Carefully take her out and set her on a cart. Do you think they'll come, sir? Oh, they'll come. They'll come all right. Here, stamp these and mail them. Eli, did you notice these Allen screws holding the wiper arms in? Not until you pointed them out. <laughs> <laughs> you think that's factory? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> They're not. They're not factory. Somebody put some real custom little screws in there to hold the wiper arms in. So the e-body cars, uh, arguably the most collectible ones on the planet, the 1970 CUDA, 1971 CUDA, 1970, 1971 Challenger uh, RT models, typically speaking, very collectible. Um, they have a soft spot in a lot of hearts. They have a special soft spot here because we've done quite a few of them. And I know we get some crap for it because why are you always working on e-bodies? What about an A-body? Well, e-bodies aren't worth any money. So when I start working on this car, especially this is an FE5 Rally Red car. So I go back to the last FE5 Rally Red car, which was Mark and Elena Daly's car the little 70 Cuda. I, if, if memory serves right, I think Elena was surprising Mark for his 50th birthday by reaching out to me and having us restore the car that they had had for quite some time. And I think they had had some issues with some previous restoration shops. So uh, when they made the connection with me, and this goes back to like season three or so of two or three of Graveyard Cars, back in the early, early days. Uh, this, was a, this was a nice little car. What they wanted when it was completely finished was a 1970 CUDA in FE5 Rally Red with 383 automatic. Now they made some modifications to it. He wanted it a little bit lower to the ground, so we did that. Uh, the interior, we had instrument specialties had done the dash on it. He wanted it to be the same color FE5 Rally Red where the wood grain would go. He wanted that to be the same color as the outside of the car. So just, you know, kind of personalize it. I know that he went with the Krager wheels on it. I believe memory surgeon with Krager wheels, we have good rich tires. And it was a nice little car when it was done. But I always go back to that being one of our very first cars at Graveyard Cars. So it has one of the softest spots for me. They're really wonderful people and it was nice to be able to do that for them. And I know that today they still enjoy it and go to all the car shows. So, you know, that's a cool legacy. Nice. 
I'm having a pretty special day today. Taking apart one of my very favorite cars, 70 Barracuda 446 pack. Uh, Slipknot is a, a rock group, I think. <laughs> I have never heard their music, honestly. What kind of music do you like to do? Ah, oh, boy. 70s, 80s rock and roll. Eli, I think, was over my shoulder all the time. Anytime I was taking anything apart, working on it, he was right there with me. And uh, he's a natural, great mechanic. <laughs> Showed up the old man, didn't you, Eli? Huh? Nothing. See if we can't uh, rock our wipers off here. Just kind of pull up on them, rock them back and forth a little bit. Is that a strong man job, Doug? Takes a little bit of technique. Barracuda wipers have uh, an unusual second arm that gives them their transition across the windshield. So, uh, yeah. Almost like a peace sign, huh? <laughs> Some of the shiny little screws holding the wiper arms in. That's not factory correct? No, sir. They're pretty, though. I like them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Very nice. Look how nice the padding is in the back of this thing. This has been restored. This stuff is just like new. Yeah, it's, I think it's been restored once. Barracuda trunk lock assembly. All in one piece. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this car has obviously been restored one time. And since it hasn't been that many years since it was done, it's a lot easier to work on something like this because everything is still pretty fresh compared to most of the original cars that we work on, which have been sitting for, I lost track how many years. Those are hard to work on. Everything's rusted really bad. And this stuff's pretty fresh, so this is kind of nice. That's different, different. I'm gonna see the light. Okay. Finally. <laughs> Screws. So much trouble. All the fasteners were all different sizes. Custom again. Here we go. The 1969 Dodge Charger Daytona is one of the most collectible Mopar muscle cars on the planet today. The only engine that was optional in this car was the 426 Hemi. So what was the standard engine? Was it the 383 Magnum, the 440 Magnum, or the 446 Pack? Stay tuned after the break and I'll give you the answer. All right, folks, how did you do on that one? What was the standard engine in our Charger Daytona? Was it the 383, the 440, the 446 pack? To get the answer, we're gonna do a little history. The 1969 Dodge Charger Daytona was based on a 1969 Dodge Charger RT, and that 1969 Dodge Charger RT had a standard 440 Magnum. It means that our Daytona Charger had a 440 Magnum as a standard engine, with the Hemi being the only option. The 383 Magnum was available in a 69 Dodge Charger that was not an RT, and the 446 pack, even though it was introduced on the Super B and the Roadrunner in 1969 and a half, it wasn't an available option on the Dodge Charger until the 1970 model year. If you guys have been watching previous episodes, you should have got that one right. So. In fact, my shirt is Evil Knievel. Grew up on that stuff. The guys have been doing real good so far on the disassembly. I've been busy inside working on different cars, so I finally got a break where I can come out and look at the car. I feel like when somebody sends me a car to restore, if it's not a tribute car that we're building for somebody or they already know it's a tribute car, then I don't need to validate it. But I feel like it's part of my obligation to the Mopar Society to do my best to make sure that my owner, what they say to me, is accurate. 
right? They, they're only repeating what was told to them when they bought the car. So in this case, this is supposed to be a numbers matching, original 70, 446 barrel, four speed, super track pack, FE5 Rally Red. I've been doing this for a long time. I've seen people play with numbers. I've seen people fake cars. It's, just, it's forgery, right? But unless you really know what you're doing and looking for, it's not that hard to get away with, it, especially on the e-body. So I'm getting ready to do some validation. I just thought maybe my friends at home might like to watch that. So another Cheers family member at Graveyard Cars is the 1971 CUDA 344 speed that we did. Again, back in probably around season three. This was the car that the owner who bought it wanted it to look like the Phantasm movie car. And, but, but not exactly. So we didn't, we didn't follow the doctrine exactly everywhere. Like we didn't cut a hole in the roof and make it a sunroof that uh, could get kicked out and you could shoot the tall man <laughs> out of. The uh, flares in the original car, the, the rear quarter panels were flared. I talked to Don Coscarelli about that. It was actually uh, Thornberry's brother that did the flaring and the pinstriping, I think, on that. This was a numbers matching 344 speed car, but it started life as a tawny gold car. Not, not the most famous color in the world. So we did a color change on it, made it black, put a black top. We added louvers. Obviously, the original Phantasm car didn't have louvers. But this is a really neat car. And, and where it came from was it was my car. I had actually bought it from one of our former employees, our nemesis, Chips cousin sold me that car and so I sold it to the customer and, and built it for him but the funnest part for me on that was having Don Coscarelli the director of the movie he's so much like me in so many ways that he's like self-made and he just had to fight tooth and nail for everything that he got but he made a movie on a very small budget and it's a successful cult classic today uh, we got to meet Michael Baldwin a Michael Baldwin uh, he came out, and so they even drove the car around. That was a kick in the pants. Uh, Don is a, uh, an interesting guy because you would not know just to meet him that he's like this diehard Mopar lover. It's been a really great day here at Graveyard Cars. Uh, having Don and Michael up has just been such a, a cool treat for everybody. I know we got a lot of signatures, uh, told some good stories. I learned a lot about the backstory on Phantasm. While it's on the ground and the hood is off, it's easy to see the last eight digits of the vehicle identification number that are stamped into the upper cowl. That was one of the hidden numbers, quote unquote, that Chrysler said they had. They're supposed to match the title, the dash, the door, and the course support. Then I'm gonna check the course support to make sure that those numbers match. If they match, that's great. I need to make sure that those panels started life on that car. So on the, on the outside looking at it, the numbers actually match the last eight. So if you go here, B, that's the first letter right here. That's where the car was built, Hamtramck, Michigan. Zero, 1970. This is the serial number of the car, 178673. So if you go over here to the dash vehicle identification number, here you have the full vehicle identification number. B, Barracuda, S, special meaning Akuda, 23 two-door hardtop, V, 390 horsepower, 446 barrel engine. And now we pick up with the numbers that are in the upper cowl. Zero for 70, B for Hamtramck. One, seven, eight, six, seven, three. That means that this tag and this cowl started life at the same time, at the same place. What I need to make sure of is that the bottom of these numbers look clean. What I need to make sure of is that the bottom of these numbers look clean, that there's no evidence anybody's re-stamped the cow. So I do that with a mirror. And that is beautiful, absolutely. Nobody has had that panel off. Now I turn it sideways here and I can actually see the welds, the backside of these welds that I was talking about a little bit ago. I can see the backside. This would be the kind of stuff you'd be looking for if you were trying to determine if a car was had been fraudulated. I come back over to this side of the cowl and you can see the seam sealer that they put on at the factory that went on between the cowl and the upper cowl panel. It's still evident in there. That's beautiful stuff. Nobody's been here. 
That also tells me nobody's changed the panel and nobody stamped the numbers. So I can validate that as an original panel. Another car that we did uh, a lot of restoration on but didn't install the drivetrain on this one uh, was Chris's 1970 AAR, uh, FY1 Lemon Twist Yellow, uh, six barrel AAR, four speed car. And uh, I had made a deal with him to do just the body and paint on that car. And uh, we did do a suspension in it so it could roll. It came out beautiful. Uh, my favorite color, other than the burnt orange on my charger, would be the top banana lemon twist yellow. I love the color. I'm colorblind, as everybody knows. So when I see limelight green, I'm seeing lemon twist yellow. So to me, it's all good. It doesn't matter, I don't care what the coat is. It's beautiful yellow. So with the strobe striping down the side, the blackout on the hood and the tops of the fenders, I mean, that was a really fun build too. So it's great, the cowl is the original cowl. You could tell by the patina on the bottom side of it, the rust. There was no heat ring. I'm really happy that the cowl matches. Okay, so I wanna take a look at the numbers in the upper tie bar or the core support. So the radiator support is the part of the car at the front that actually holds the radiator. Now these numbers were stamped in like this. So they read left to right, but they're upside down. I'm just gonna wedge this in there so I can actually get that radiator away from it. It might be really hard for everybody to see it, but it is the last eight digits. It's Bravo 0178673. They're stamped in nicely. It's got the right amount of dent into it as a result of the number stamping. So that's perfect. So it turns out that our core support, not only is the numbers matching original core support that matches vehicle identification number of the car, but it started life on there. While I'm here, I'll just look and make sure that that radiator support hasn't changed from one car to another. So I'm gonna look at spot welds. And this is beautiful. Then the beautiful thing is, this baffle is spot welded to this inner fender. I look down there and I see the factory spot welds. This is not gonna show up well on camera, but come on over here and I'll show you at least one. I'll show you at least one. It's great when you look around and you can see that the spot welds that hold the upper radiator support and lower radiator support to the frame rail and to the inner fenders are all original unmolested spot welds. Our unit will duplicate a spot weld, but we don't have the exact same size. So you really gotta be worth your salt to know the difference between our spot welds and the factory, but that's what they pay me for. So I believe that this apron started life on this car with this radiator support and that upper cow panel. So everything from this windshield forward started life on this car. And that's a good thing. One gentleman that reached out to me had a uh, burnt orange. FK5, one of my favorite colors. Uh, 446 barrel four speed car. Really a neat car. He had had it a long time, had drug it around with him for a long time, had done some work to it, but got to that same hopeless point that so many people do. And so he reached out and talked to me about doing just the body and paint work on it, uh, which in this particular case would include you do all the body and paint, you put the windows in the car, make sure that they roll up and down the seat. You have to do the headliner in the car. We call it kind of watertight. Um, making sure that the things that, when it gets home, he just needs to bolt the car together, not deal with things like a headliner that won't go in or a glass, back glass that doesn't fit. We take care of all that stuff here. But that car was beautiful. And it was really kind of a plain outside. Uh, it was a shaker car, but all it had really is claim to fame was the black hockey six stripe. Otherwise it was just a lot of burnt orange. For me, it's great. And I think it was a beautiful car. It's so rich. It takes on a different, profile in my mind. It, it kind of goes from that raw, brutal muscle car over to more of a luxurious muscle car. So yeah, that was another car that we did. I don't remember exactly, but I think, I thought I was told that this is a numbers matching car, which means the vehicle identification number on the side of the block should match the car. We can't look at that yet till we get the car up in the air, but there is a pad on the top of these 440s that you can look at that have some alphanumeric codes on them that at least clue you if you're in the right area. I'll explain in a minute once I look. Hmm. It's ringing. No, wait, it's just a busy signal. Oh, dude, it's me, you idiot. Hello? Hello? 
Hello, anybody there? Thank goodness. Tell them we're not going to make it. What the? He hung up on me. Did anybody answer? I swear I heard somebody. And then they just hung up on me. Really? What did it sound like? Click? Idiot. All right, so Doug and Eli got the 1970 CUDA 446 barrel disassembled. So what I want to do now is go on the underside of it. I've already validated that the cowl and the core support numbers match the vehicle identification number and they started life on that car. Those are good things, but there are other markers, DNA markers, if you will, that will validate if that car's a real, at least 440 car. And I'll explain more of that once I actually get underneath there. So we're gonna start up here at the very front corner. So this right here is the piece of steel that makes up the torque box or the subframe connector. It is in place where it should be. It ties together the rocker, the cowl panel extension, and the frame rail itself. Here I'm looking at the weld. See that sporadic weld right there, but there's nothing in there? Weld, weld, weld. But when I look at it, it looks like every one I've ever worked on. They're kind of crappy welds, they're not consistent. I've come up to these and I've seen a solid bead of weld around it, all pretty. That's not right. This is right. So let's take a look at the back. These are the rear subframe connectors. In this case, all the factory stitching is in place. Terrible welds, bulky, hit and miss. Very, very factory. The other thing you see on this side and on the other side is a leaf spring hanger reinforcement. That went with all 440 cars. So if you had this mark, you're wrong. You also had these. It supported the front of the hanger to be able to handle the extra torque that would be going through the drivetrain into the rear end and twisting things around. The last one to check right over here, I expect nothing except the same. No replacement, these are factory torque boxes. Now just one last quick note is if you were working on a 70 or 71 Cuda or Challenger 426 Hemi car. If you had the Hemi option, you would also have a reinforcement plate that welded right here where the pinion snubber goes up and impacts. This doesn't have it because it's just a 440 and they didn't think it was required. But if it was a Hemi, you would have that plate right there. It's not there, that's good, it shouldn't be there. Another really cool Barracuda 71 uh, belonged to a young man up out of Portland area. Uh, he wanted it to look exactly like a 446 barrel shaker hood 71 Cuda but with us just doing the body and the paint on it. Okay. But we took the car apart, we stripped it, we dipped it, came back, we replaced the necessary sheet metal on it, and we began to build out a complete 71 appearing CUDA 446 barrel four-speed car. That car was Winchester Gray, which is truly one of the most popular, but uh, underrated colors in the world. When you're talking about the gunmetal gray and then you put the black billboards on it, all the trim, the rear window louvers, that thing really begins to shine. And like I say, it becomes more of a luxurious muscle car in that color. So that's a neat car. We sent that back to him. I think he's still working on putting it together. I haven't seen it on the road or heard anything lately, but fantastic car. Okay, so I know that the car started life as a, a 446 barrel car. I know it started life as a four speed car. What I need to do is validate the numbers on the engine to find out if that's the original one. That's the one that worries me because of the stamps that I saw on the top of it made me think somebody has been there before. All right, folks, speaking about our 1969 Dodge Charger Daytona, I have a question for you. True or false, due to the back window plug and the poor body work, it was required that all Charger Daytonas receive a black vinyl top. Think you know the answer? Stay tuned after the break. We'll find out together. Jim Root is a uh, lead guitarist for the group Slipknot. So I also have a 34-year-old son who just loves Slipknot, rock star, and he used to rock out to this music, and uh, he is so envious of Eli and I being able to work on Jim's car, and I mean, he is just 
drooling. He wants to meet this guy so bad. <laughs> yeah. Do you think you'll go to any Slipknot concerts with your other son? Me? Yes. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Have you ever listened to Slipknot? I have never heard any of his music. Would you like to? Yeah. <laughs> All right. This. Thank you. All you gotta do is hit play. Hit play. Hit parade. Oh wow. Ooh. Uh no, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> huh. No, I don't think I can do that. No, it's not for everybody. Uh, I don't think I can do that. <laughs>
if you're Kimberly and Tommy Cook with the Barracuda, I wanna do that car as cheap as possible as far as financially so you can afford to do it. So I can know in my heart and in my mind that that car was done right. So it doesn't matter if you're Jim Root. I don't care if you're a celebrity, or if you're just a guy that works, punches a clock. I don't care. My job is to put as many Mopars on the road as correctly as I can in my time. And that is really what Graveyard Cars has and always will be about. So we know in our 70 Cuda that the body numbers match, the dash VIN is original, all of the torque boxes and body numbers are in place, so we feel good that it's a real live 70 V code 446 barrel CUDA. I didn't like the stamping that I saw on the top of the ID pad. So I had Doug and Eli bring the engine and transmission in, that's what we got over here. I want to take time and look at everything carefully. Clear your mind. Erase everything from your mind. It's if this was Men in Black, I'd hit you with one of those things and you'd forget everything so I could work with a clean slate. It's pretty much how I wake up any, every day. Anyways. This is a great opportunity as she's beginning to grow more and more into the role of shop manager. I'd like to acclimate her with what I find and in real time, not after I found it, but in real time. Jim Root, Slipknot. You're young, you know, right? The band. Oh, whatever. Right? Okay. I know Slipknot the band is a band. Like it's a band. I've heard of it. I just don't listen to that type of music, so I don't know them. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I already know that's not gonna go over well, but I don't know. So this is the ID pad that I want to talk about. Okay. So I've got to try to get that orange pin. How off. would you determine Look at if how that comes off of there in sheets? I don't think that someone could step in and do my dad's job. I mean, I think it would take years and years in training, but I think that it's way overwhelming for me because, I mean, it's like forensic files. You have to know all the little details, what's right to begin with, and that that just gets crazy. It's different on every year, different every make of car. It gets insane, so. Okay, first thing, you see the turquoise paint? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All 440 HPs in 1969. Mm -hmm. 70 and 71 were orange. That's a non high performance engine. They okay. didn't even have the decency to get the paint off of it. Criminals. Yep. So at first glance on the engine, the numbers look fine to me because I don't have a trained eye like my dad does to be able to tell, you know, but just by looking at it, if it's wrong or right. Follow the trajectory, forget the pattern. I'm gonna show you big problems with the pattern. That's way too tight of a pattern. See how close the lines are together? Mm -hmm. The factory 10 inch mill was wider apart than that. It's probably a smaller wheel. This is a lot bigger. Oh, bigger. If I follow that all the way out here, it would be about a 24 inch, 18 to 24 inch mill head. They're too close together. That's number one. I know from doing these cars since I was a little kid that that font is something that an aftermarket piece of crap punch set made. Okay. So All right. Okay. Should have a number right here. Mm -hmm. Then down here in the corner, it should say HP or HP2, high performance first shift or high performance second shift. Well, to me, it sounds like this is probably worst case scenario for us because it sounds like we're dealing with a fraudulent engine, but it's hard to tell because my dad's just neurotic. So everything is like level 10. It'll be obvious visually but I'm still gonna set this. But then when we compared it to Tony's engine, you could see clear as day how different the font was and the sizes and all the flaws really came out. 214.214, mm -hmm. but you can physically see how much taller these letters are. Let's raise this engine up in the air. Eye height, oh, oh boy. So when I see that, I'm already getting worried. What's up high doesn't make me happy. Let me look down here. So here you can see it's the July 28th, 1969 casting date. So that's right. We know that the first day of production for 1970 models was August 1st, 1969. Mm -hmm. So this part's right. They found probably out of a 70 Chrysler New Yorker, they found a non-HP 440. That's why it was turquoise. But if they're that intelligent, why would they mess up? You know what I mean? It was 2001 and they didn't, uh -oh. nobody knew back then. It seems crazy to me that someone would go through all the effort to create a fraudulent engine when they could put that effort into just like getting a good job and being a good employee and all that, but I, I don't understand people. I definitely don't understand people after working here. When? See the turquoise? Yeah. Well, that would be yeah, nice. Take a look at the three. It's rounded on the top uh -huh. and rounded on the bottom. Come look at this three. Yeah. See how this one has the flat flag across there uh -huh. and then it goes in? 
So at first it might seem overwhelming to be able to tell if an engine is correct or not, but when you start going through all the minute details, like the milling on the on the engine block and the size of the numbers, if all of them are the same size, because that was something that we ran into with that engine is that one number would be really large and the next one next to it would seem quite small. So that's a red flag and all those things add up. And if you see one of one red flag, keep following the trail, you'll probably find the rest. I think somebody added the three and the eight. Look at that eight, the seven, and this seven and this one are the right size. That one, that one, and that one have been put in. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. that's a little fakery, call it fakery. So I've got to let him know somebody restamped the engine. Okay. This is one of the situations that you don't want to have to call the owner. The, the numbers obviously, as I had mentioned, have been stamped in and not even good, not a good job. It's a bad forgery. It's a forgery, it's a bad forgery. It's the right date code, but it probably was never an HP engine. There's too much negativity around that engine for me to want to put it back in the car. The stuff that was bolted onto it, like the intake and the exhaust, I can reuse all that. The hardest part from here isn't finding a block, it's calling Jim and letting him know. I would be scared to death to have to make that call. That would not be the call I want to make. But my dad has a way with words. He's really good at delivering really bad news to people and then taking it okay. So I hope that this goes the same way. So I know right now, I think he's touring in Europe. So I've got to leave him a message and I'll try to have a phone call with him later this week, hopefully to let him know what's going on. I'm hoping he doesn't go ballistic, but if he does, I'm more than happy to give him his money back for the deposit, bolt the car back together and he could take a legal action if he wanted to. I just, I just don't think he will. I'm, I'm willing to find an F440 HP and donate it to the cause because my big old dumb heart, that's what I do. You know? I believe in getting the cars as close as we can to the factory. And if that means I got to reach in my pocket a little bit, that's okay. It, it's not about the money. Call. I did a good job for you. Call him mm. up and give him the bad news. No, I don't even like talk that. to him. No. This is the call only the president can make. Do you know what, what you movie know that's I don't from? I know what movie that's from. So I've come to realize that my dad has no original material. <laughs> I made it into my 20s thinking that my dad was really funny and that he has like all these great jokes and like I would repeat them to my friends. And then I realized like he didn't come up with it, that it was like Rush Hour or Tommy Boy or whatever movie it was. And so yeah, my dad's just recycled. It's not. Call only a president can make. So he, so he picks up the phone and he's talking to him. And he says, yes, yeah, the president, JFK. Bye dad. Jack. I just walk away. When my dad gets too crazy, the best thing to do is walk away because if he has an audience, then he's gonna perform. Had to tell him, I need you to hold off on this. And he goes, hey, I held off on the Bay of Pigs, man. It was the worst mistake I ever made in my life. Right? But he got him to do it, and that's good. See, there was a lot of manipulation going on there. There was a lot of strategy. John Fitzgerald Kennedy avoided going to war through strategy. What'd you say, what was the question? Cuba.